Morning, everybody. I wanted to go over uh, my clinical culture document that I've been working on for quite a while. Um, hopefully, you'll find this helpful. You know, a couple of things um, that I would share with you before um, I jump into this is this is a work in progress. Um, this is something that uh, ongoing we'll be adding to it. When we rolled it out to the uh, clinical team members and the front office team members earlier this week, I told them this is a living, breathing document. And so as things, as best practices come forward, as we learn more, as we adjust, um, there's a very good chance that this document will change. So essentially I've got a two-page document. On the first page is some general overview of the PPE process, how we handle patients in the office. The second page is a clinical overview. Um, so I'm going to go through it with you here. Hopefully it won't be uh, too cumbersome. It'll be helpful um, for you to give you some information about how I practice. So first and foremost, um, patients and team members come first. You know, Richard Branson always talks about making sure that the employees, the team, the staff, however you want to refer to them, um, are at the top of the list. So I would put them equal in importance with our patients. Um, one of the things to bear in mind, though, is our team members essentially do the work for us. They do a large percentage of the work for us in helping to serve the patients. So it's really critical that we maintain a good interaction, good positive interaction with our team members. Um, sometimes that familiarity breed, uh, breeds contempt, holds true in, in businesses and dental offices, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important that we maintain a positive um, interaction skill set with our, with our team. Not only that, but with our patients. We should be treating them the same, and it should be the highest level of, of interaction, care, and concern. So growth mindset, as opposed to being a very closed, you know, lack of ability to incorporate new uh, procedures and plans, we want to have a very positive growth mindset so that our challenges are viewed as opportunities instead of roadblocks. And then this here that's hidden under me is, is positive outcomes. Everything we want to focus on being a positive outcome. Um, we want to focus toward positive outcomes do our very best to maintain positive outcomes. So even if we fail, even if we make a mistake, um, the outcome, the learning, can still be very positive. So I would encourage you to bear that in mind. We focus on and we hold fast to the per perfect patient experience process for every single patient interaction. We believe the patients pay our salaries. Therefore, we must do everything that it takes to please them and provide them with the highest quality of care so they will continue to return to focus or to uh, to allow us to treat them. So as we focus on those positive experiences with our patients, positive service experiences, they'll come back. They'll see us again. They'll bring their friends, their family, their co their coworkers, um, and the practices will continue to grow. So one of the things that we have had a challenge with, and many offices do, is incorporating uh, repeatedly incorporating the meet and greet with the doctor. We always want to do our very best to have the doctor meet and greet the patient where possible, pulling them back from the, ex, from the uh, front office to the x-ray room or to the consult room or to the treatment operatory um, before x-rays are taken, before the exam is. We want to spend a few minutes, which most people do, but we want to spend a few minutes intentionally having a conversation that's not dental related with the patient. Um, we want them to understand that we're human beings before we're teeth technicians, if you will. And we want to connect with them on a very deep level so that they can understand that we're here for them. Not that they're here for us, but they are, but we're here for them. Okay? So we do this for every initial exam, every comprehensive exam. If patients come in on an emergency exam and we've got them to know pretty well, you know, to know them pretty well, we don't necessarily need to do another meet and greet with them, but uh, reconnecting with them um, on a personal level is really critical. Okay, during this initial exam, this meet and greet rather, during the meet and greet, we want to uncover the four chiefs. You know, the reason they're here, the chief concern, the chief fit issue, um, the chief disability, and the chief benefits. Um, this is a whole entire lecture, several hours worth of conversation if we want to dig into it. But basically, we want to understand why they're here and what we can do to help them. And then their individual stumbling blocks or stepping stones or roadblocks or difficulties for allowing us to help them, which a lot of time is... Fear, cost, and time. Those are the big, the big challenges that we run into in dentistry. So understanding which one of those or which blending of those or which ratio um, is going to be a barrier to, to the patient moving forward with treatment will help us to cater to them a little more specifically as we're discussing and recommending appropriate treatment. Okay, at this point we should be ordering prescriptive x-rays. Really critical that the x-rays are unique to each patient. Now oftentimes the x-rays that are unique to each patient 
are similar across the board for many patients. You know, a full, full exam for an adult generally for me involves a CBCT, high resolution x-ray, um, with a set of bite wings, anterior PAs, and intraoral photos. Generally, almost all of my initial exams with adult patients will involve that set of x-rays. However, I still need to order the appropriate x-rays for this patient. Can't just have a standing order, even though generally that, that uh, set of x-rays is similar. While the x-rays are being taken, we want to do the best with our time to take advantage of our time by evaluating the x-rays as they're coming up, um, if possible. Now, sometimes we're in a treatment operatory, sometimes we're doing things, so we can't do that. But do our very best to identify what's going on. Identify the current clinical condition, which ideally the assistants will help us enter the current situation, fillings and crowns and, you know, a broken tooth or a missing tooth or a bridge. Um, but then we're identifying conditions. Um, and it's important as we're identifying conditions that we're not attaching treatment to those conditions without a conversation with a patient. Um, as many of you have heard me say, when we're having a conversation with a patient about a clinical condition, we don't want to jump over the consequence. We want to go from the condition to the consequence to the treatment, um, the problem to the consequence to the solution. Sometimes we go straight from the problem, the cavity, to the solution, the filling or the crown or the root canal or the whatever it is, without clearly explaining the consequence and the urgency to the patient. So I would encourage you, as you're going through this identification process, reviewing the x-rays and putting in conditions, cavities and whatever, that you don't enter treatment at this point, or that when you do enter treatment, you're very intentional about discussing it with the patient about the consequences of the condition with the patient. Okay, so in our practice, again, the clinical culture, the clinical standard of care is to do our very best to review these x-rays so the patient's time in the chair is lessened. We want to not only have some of this back-end work, behind-the-scenes work done before the patient comes in, but we also want to make sure that the patient can feel a sense of confidence. Oh, the doctor's already reviewed my x-rays um, or largely reviewed them so that when we come to the room we're not fumbling and you know looking around at x-rays. A lot of the processes that we use that give us confidence um, may, from a patient standpoint, um, look like we're fumbling or not sure what's happening. So try to read the x-rays beforehand and ours is our clinical culture whenever possible to do that. Um, one other item, moving on, framing the exam, helping the patient understand what they're about to experience. Um, you know, telling them before we do anything to them is really critical. So I usually tell my patients, we're going to do a three-part exam here. Part number one, we're going to check the teeth, we're going to evaluate the gums, and we're going to do an oral cancer screening. That's the three-part exam. That way they know what's happening. And I'll explain, of course, as they're going through, uh, as we're going through the exam, what that looks like. Um, one critical piece of the puzzle, more critical than framing the exam, is framing the full mouth probe. Many patients don't know what's happening as you're poking them 168 times. So it's important that we frame exactly what we're doing. Mrs. Smith, I'm going to be measuring the gum pockets in between your tooth and your gums. This will tell us how healthy your gums are. Healthy numbers are ones, twos, or threes. So as you're listening, please let me know if you have any questions or concerns. Um, but we'll, we'll explain what's going on here in a little bit. All right, so framing that uh, full mouth probe with the patient is really, really critical so that they understand what's happening. I always do a full mouth probe once a year on 18 year, 18 year olds and up. Um, as we have PMB patients that come back in, um, then they should have a full mouth probe done every single time they come in to track their progress. Now, later on, later on in the stages of periodontal management when they're totally controlled, Sometimes we can spread that full mouth probe out to six months or even back to a year if it's perfectly controlled, but I would be very cautious about that. Okay, oral cancer screening. We always do an oral cancer screening once per year on 18-year-olds and up. Um, case conversation. This is where I was uh, discussing. Um, it's really important that we, we talk with our patients about the consequences. So our standard of care, our clinical culture, is to always discuss the consequences of the issues that we find and the urgency of those consequences. If we, for instance, say, you have a cavity, you need a filling. Okay, patients probably heard that before. They understand that they have a cavity. They might understand kind of what it is. Um, they may understand why they need a filling. But if we can understand to them, you have a cavity, we can help them understand, you have a cavity in your tooth. If left untreated, there's a very good chance this cavity will pro progress to the point where the tooth either breaks or you develop a really significant toothache. So. What we need to do to prevent that from becoming an overnight nightmare, or in whatever language you use, um, is to consider a crown as soon as possible. 
Um, many doctors, and what works really, really well is if you explain the consequence and then you wait. Allow some time for the patient to absorb that. So Mrs. Smith, my concern with this cavity is if it's left untreated, it'll eventually develop to a broken tooth or a tooth that's not fixable. And then we wait. We're not trying to be manip manipulative. We're not trying to, you know, twist the patient's arm. What we're trying to do is help the patient understand how important it is. So taking some time to stop, allow it to settle in, to soak in. Um, oftentimes the patient will then ask, oh, okay, well, what do we do to fix that? Now we know that they're engaged, they're connected. Many patients won't, and I'm not saying wait indefinitely. But if we allow time for the patient to ask, what do we do to fix it? We know we've got an engaged patient who's interested in learning how we can fix that. But going from the problem now to the consequence and the urgency, we need to try to treat this as soon as possible um, with a crown. And I'd like to do that today, which is the next line here, offer to start treatment today. I'd like to try to start that today, if at all possible. Does that work for you? To the patient will help them to understand not only number one we're focusing on the patient's well-being but we're also concerned enough about this problem we want to try to treat it right now since you're here um, we usually come up with a long laundry list of items fillings and you know our cavities and fractures and whatever um, so I always ask the patient as part of this case conversation what they want us to focus on do you want us to try to come up with a comprehensive treatment plan that addresses every single concern or with your permission, we could focus on the top two or three items. Mrs. Smith, is it okay with you if we focus on the top two or three concerns today? And then when you come back in for a checkup, a six month evaluation, we can look at the next top two or three concerns. How does that sound? Now, some patients situation will fit nicely into this category, but some won't. So I would encourage you to be very cautious. We don't want to not recommend treatment. We always want to recommend treatment where it's appropriate and where it's necessary. We don't want to delay treatment, but for many patients, if we can focus on those emergent, immediate concerns now and reevaluate soon, that may work better and we may be able to provide a little better care for them because we're not scaring them away with a $12,000 treatment plan that's 100 items long. Okay? We always do our best to prioritize CAD CAM restorations because the, the Teeth that need CAD CAM restorations are the ones that have the biggest problems in my experience. Of course, if there's an abscess or a periodontal condition, we want to treat the infection first, but prioritize those larger restorations um, that need you know, the CAD CAM restorations, the larger issues that need CAD CAM restorations because they're usually the ones that have the biggest problems. Now in page two, which I'm going to do in a separate video, um, is my clinical, personal clinical choice decision tree which I'll kind of walk you through here in a little bit in a little bit more detail don't want this video to get too long um, but we'll talk a little bit about that CAD CAM and the choices of making a choice versus a composite versus an inlay versus a crown versus a whatever so next step is the BC handoff this is really super duper critical because this allows me as the doctor having spent 10-15 minutes with the patient now to take the trust that I've developed and earned with that patient and now hand that trust to the benefits coordinator in the presence of the patient. So as I'm doing my best to hand off to the patient what's going on, um, hand off to the BC what's going on with the patient, then the patient is much more likely, number one, to get a reconfirmation of what I just explained to them from the standpoint of problems and consequences and solutions, but number two, to feel like um, we're really interested in, in caring for them and taking care of their issues. So the BC handoff basically works like this. You know, the, the benefits coordinator will be brought into the room, whether it's by me or the assistant, and I'll introduce the patient to the benefits coordinator. You know, uh, Mrs. Smith, this is Jill. Jill's our benefits coordinator. She's the lady with the expertise that'll help you understand how you can fit the dentistry that you want into your budget. And then I will now turn and connect with the benefits coordinator, Jill or Chloe or whoever it is, and say, Jill, this is Mrs. Smith. Um, she has a large cavity tooth number three. My concern is, see I'm re-emphasizing the concern and the urgency here in a second. My concern is if left untreated, this large cavity could lead to the point where it's a significant toothache uh, or a tooth that may not be fixable. And so we want to try to treat that as soon as possible. There's the urgency. So again, I introduced Mrs. Smith to Jill and then I addressed Jill this is Mrs. Smith. She has tooth number three, large cavity. If left untreated, there's the consequence. We want to try to treat that as soon as possible. There's the urgency. Would you see if you can find a way to make this treatment fit into, into Mrs. Smith's budget so we can try to get that started today, if at all possible? 
And then usually my benefits coordinator says, absolutely, we'll try to do whatever we can to help you get this, this treatment started, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really critical at that point now to make sure that you allow appropriate time for the benefits coordination, um, the FA generation with the, the patient, and also to check in with the patient again um, to make sure they don't have any questions before you leave the room and to let them know that you're still in the office, you're not running away. So Mrs. Smith, I'll let Jill take it from here. If you have any questions, I'll be close by. I'm not gonna leave. All right, great. So then you leave and you know go on to whatever treatment. Um, one thing that we have made a hard and fast rule in my practice is that the BC, anyone that's not clinical should not be discussing clinical treatment, um, options or materials, etc. Not because you know they don't understand. Many front office team members do a fantastic job of explaining those, but it muddies the water and it makes it more challenging for the clinician, the doctor that's recommended the treatment, to recommend the treatment that they feel is best for the patient. If I have a benefits coordinator that sits down and says, well, we need a crown, and you have seven different options, the fired crown, the zirconia fired crown, the in-office lab, the blah, 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 whatever these are, the patient's just, oh my goodness. So the phrase that we use is, Mrs. Smith, this is the treatment that the doctor's recommended for you. It's a seric fired crown. It's delivered in one appointment. It's made out of a high strength material. Does this, does this sound okay to you? And they can even go into less detail than that after they've gone over the estimate. But the idea is to reinforce this is what the doctor's recommended for you, for this patient, not necessarily for every patient. We, do, we don't want to be a, you know, come and pick your favorite color type of, a, uh, of an office. We want to be a, this is what the appropriate treatment is for you in this clinical situation. And to kind of finish off this video, the very last piece of that puzzle is hopefully the patient will be like, yes, absolutely. We find a way to fit the de dental treatment they need into their budget and we get started today. But many times the patient will not want to start and that's for a variety of reasons. Now, hopefully we've done our research and we've gotten that chief fit issue addressed and, and figured out in our meet and greet. But what should happen is the BC should come back to the doctor and say, hey, Miss, Mrs. Smith isn't ready to start today, um, financially or time-wise, or she's scared or whatever. Um, so we're gonna try to get her on the schedule, whatever, whatever. And then I, as the doctor, would try to go back into the room and say, hey, Mrs. Smith, I understand that you didn't want to start today. Is there, are there any concerns or issues that I can help? To, to maybe get the process moving along for you. And she might say something like, well, I'm concerned that I'm gonna be here for five hours with this crown and this root canal and tooth number three. And I can say something like, well, that, that's not very likely. Generally, this process takes about 90 minutes to two hours. Would that work better into, you, into your time? So oftentimes, that reverse BC, meaning the BC coming back to the clinician and saying, it doesn't look like we're gonna start, allows me as a clinician another opportunity to try to recapture or to assist that patient in starting treatment today or soon, depending on, on what the, the process is for that patient. So all that being said, the whole purpose here, if we go all the way back up to the top, is to focus on positive outcomes and remember that the perfect patient experience is our, our goal. That's what we're here for, is providing a perfect patient experience so we can create patients for life in the long run. So that's uh, generally the PPE culture document um, that we have generated as, a, as an office together, me as an owner doctor putting this together. In the next video, I'll talk about my clinical standards, um, and we'll go into a lot of detail about that. So thanks for watching. Bye.